go back to Rome, ancient Rome time. Did they have medicine? No. They did not have medicine. Oh my god. Yes. We call the deep So I've just I just realized something that I never visualize what I do before I paint it. Yeah, I know what you mean. I like never think about, oh, I'm going to do the fire, I'm not going to do the, the, the flamethrower because you're going to do it. But I just do, do something. Yeah. Do, do, I want to be my baby. Baby. Oh, baby. Oh. Everybody dance in the hole. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Woo! Let's, let's smoke some food rock, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so upset they don't do hand jobs at the, the, the crazy cock anymore. I just, I can't believe it. <laughs> so how, how should we structure this video? First of all, thank you fans for watching. I, usually, I usually say, welcome friends and family. Um, That's I, what I, usually say. I, I, I say, welcome the public and society. <laughs> <laughs> and how, what should be our outro? I think it should be a, 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 I just go peace. Peace. This is a place it's called First Sight, Colchester. And we're going to see Mark Titchener first, followed by Cohn and Simon, Sioban. I don't know how to pronounce their names, so we're going to see them in their gallery places. It's a bit of a paraphrase, um, but it's to do with the idea that if the universe is growing, if you imagine it kind of expanding like this, then the perimeter gets bigger. So although we know more, the amount that we don't know is kind of growing larger and larger as well. And I kind of it's a text that I came across quite a long time ago and my favourite text I tend to kind of reuse and reconfigure and it's something that around had come back into my thinking I suppose around Brexit and this whole sort of idea of a divided and fragmented society it seemed kind of appropriate to that so the yeah the colour scheme for it this sort of slightly weird colour screen is all based on kind of this if you imagine getting a Pantone samples of the Union Jack and then turning it down it's all kind of yeah kind of some pastel yeah. version of the Union Jack um, and I can't I don't think you can see it very well there's three kind of rings so and behind that is a kind of cross which is based that's the culture of the Pope France so I kind of wanted to make it quite quite specific but I'm quite interested in how towns have these specific mottos as a sort of burning form of advertising and just kind of attempt to a reconfigure coat of arms. Colchester actually has a really hardcore slogan for its like town. It's um, the, uh, no cross, no crown, which is like kind of pretty unequivocal. Kind of yeah. So yeah. Screensavers, that kind of thing of like it's like killing time or something, or it's like this sort of no, the use of, there's something about labour, I suppose, within them sitting here watching it in silence. Well. <laughs> yeah, so the soundtrack is sort of a, a collaboration with two musicians that I work with a lot, um, and it does really 
when it was first shown, it was shown in a place called Dilston Grove, which is like in South London, which is a kind of a, a church, basically. So the um, it's very large kind of projections at either end, and it, the sort of soundtrack is sort of very choral. And it was based on the, the, I'd been re I'd been reading um, about this well, a couple of things. One thing was this thing called Cuba, which is a CIA declassified CIA interrogation manual, and it was basically uh, yeah techniques to get people to tell you what they want. And I was kind of interested. And it had all kinds of horrible you know stuff like we hear about like waterboarding. It also kind of seemed to emphasise that the best way to get people to tell you what you want is to convince them that you're their friend and that they will tell you everything truthfully rather than kind of lie to you. So in this work, again, I wanted to kind of set up this sort of situation where it's quite sort of melodramatic. It's sort of, I don't know, bigging you up and then kind of turns right at the, right at the end. Um, all the footage is... There were four screens originally, so it was based on each one of the screens was based on one of the four elements. Um, at this point, they are all kind of cut up and uh, in, intermingled. And it was called Rose 2 Regions 1, which was because of the, well, actually, the, the, red, the red dot um, and the uh, footprints. So the first version of this that I've made um, was in 2003, and it was um, at the old Art Now space in Cape Breton, and it was really different to this. It still had the big banner, but instead of the microphones, there was this weird device that I made, which was like a uh, group primal scream therapy device. So basically, you were just invited to go in and scream as loud as you could into this, this object. And then it was connected to some bass speakers filled with ink, so that whilst you were screaming, other people could watch the vibrations in the ink. And it was about, I, I mean, in a way, that, was, that piece was, it was quite complicated. In a way, I didn't really like in hindsight. But the idea, really, at that point, when I was making the work of the gallery that we did at that point, was to think about subverting behaviour. Uh, to get people to think, well, the gallery is a public space, how do I act in this space? So if, some, if an artist invites you into an exhibition and tells you to do something which you wouldn't normally do in an exhibition, is that kind of all right? Um, and it came from a really pure old place in a way, because there was a Bridget Wright exhibition on next door, and I just I was looking at one of the early op art pieces, thinking, wow, this is like so kind of visually amazing. Overwhelming, I was just like, it would be really great to shout really loudly in here. And then, so I liked the idea that people in the exhibition kind of could hear people next door shouting really loudly through the wall. Um, and then, yeah, the, there's been other iterations of it. I, th I think this is the most pared down one. Like, it, when the last version of this, where it was, when it was in Warsaw, this, the stage was like raised off the ground, there was some video components, and the actual bit with the microphones was a kind of big sculpture of carved objects that you kind of interacted with. Whereas I felt, I guess just going on with my practice, it just, I, I kind of wanted it to, be, it to be as open and as straightforward as possible, and for it not to uh, be, I don't know, not to have too much artifice within it. But yeah, generally, I don't know, have, have people been using it much here? Kids love it. Kids love it, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, lots of kids love it. We had, uh, we've had a few buskers come in. Uh, there was one last week. Um, I've used it a couple of times. What did you should actually use it for now, really. Yeah, well, yeah, I used it for a meeting. I made that announcement. Um, yeah, but it's a bit of information about it here. It, yeah. it does say, like, you know, in the past it's been used for prayer or for beatboxing or gallery staff have used it to make announcements and give you new readings. So I suppose within the exhibition it's supposed to be a kind of open platform but it's also supposed to be something with an element of chance involved with it. So you don't know. Unfortunately the reality of everything in the art world is much less happens than you think it actually would. Like you just think people would use it but it's actually not. I don't know what to say or what to do. It's 
here is with most museums is getting people in isn't it? Yeah I think uh, when when Flashlight originally started it was very much just you know the typical all white walls normal gallery and then Sally the director took over and, uh, and since then we've just been trying to like have our meetings outside of the office so people can come and listen to what our meetings are about and um, so like the, the super black space we call it the living room so we can actually go sit in there and have our meetings in there as well and just trying to see it more as a social pub rather than a gallery, like I said, with the refugee action and the conferences. But it's just used for everything, which is really, really nice. And it, it creates that relationship with that same community and culture. So there is kind of like weirdly within the show these aspects of painting kind of creeping through. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask about the other one, the gilded piece, because there's something about the process of gilding, I was thinking about that being like really medieval, and it's something that, in a way, is quite a meditative process, because it's really hard to do, isn't it? Well, it's hard to do to do properly, but I think if you kind of just do it in the way that I do it, it's probably not that hard, because I, I kind of waste a lot, I'm not very good at doing it, and also, and I think with that, the reason I covered all of that... Say something, yeah. To do with materiality, you know, to make it have a um, sort of, you know, like a complete surface, so it's kind of se semi reflective as well. Um, I think it's a really interesting, you know, several of the things you've said have been about that juxtaposition between the work that might be quite digital or I suppose conceptual, working through a computer and then wanting to get very hands on. So I think that's for probably most of our painting students, that's quite an important relationship because I would think it's fair to say that as a course we're quite hands on course, aren't we? But also people are very interested in context and ideas and, you know, I mean, I found it quite difficult in a way because, like I say, most of what I do now is not in galleries. Like, I do a lot of my work on site or working in situations. So, like, in a way, it's nice to do it. I mean, you're Jude, sorry. <laughs> and you're Jake. <laughs> and we are... Of the Sex Pistols. <laughs> no. Groovy, baby! <laughs>